Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Yogic Studies Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Powell, and this is episode 17. I want to take a moment here at the top of the episode to wish everyone a happy new year, a happy 2021. 2020 is now in the books. Whew. This past year was so challenging, complex, and just exhausting, really, for the entire world. For many of us, the pandemic continues to alter and upheave our day-to-day lives. And yet, the silver lining of 2020 has been what we can accomplish remotely through online education and the virtual communities we can create. While they may never completely replace the importance of being together in person, they also allow for some incredible opportunities. We launched this podcast back in May 2020, and this has been a really meaningful space and fun project to cultivate. I've really enjoyed hosting these conversations with scholars. But I'd also love to hear more from you, the listener. We've set up a new podcast email, and I'd like to invite you to reach out. Send us your comments, questions, and feedback about the podcast. Are there particular scholars, books, or topics that you'd like to hear covered? I'd like to start doing some mailbag episodes where I can take questions directly from listeners. So drop me a line at podcast at yogicstudies.com. All right, today's episode is with Dr. Stuart Sarbacker, professor at Oregon State University and the author of an exciting new book, Tracing the Path of Yoga. I've known Stuart for some years now through the conference circuit, and I've been a long fan of his work. I was fortunate to read and comment on an early draft of this book manuscript, and now having seen the final text, I have to say I'm really impressed with it. I think it's a book that can appeal to both yoga practitioners and academics, which is a difficult balance that we're always striving for here at Yogic Studies. The book should be out soon, so I encourage listeners to check it out. Stuart Ray Sarbacker is an associate professor of philosophy and religion in the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion at Oregon State University. His work is centered on the relationships between the religious and philosophical traditions of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism, especially with respect to the practices of yoga and tantra including both bodily disciplines and contemplative practices. He also works on issues related to method and theory in the study of religion, with a particular focus on religious experience and its interpretation. He received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and has performed institutional study and fieldwork in India, Nepal, and Japan. He has written three books, including Samadhi, The Numinous and Sessitive in Indo-Tibetan Yoga, The Eight Limbs of Yoga, a Handbook for Living Yoga Philosophy, and the forthcoming Tracing the Path of Yoga, The History and Philosophy of Indian Mind-Body Discipline, published by Sunni Press. In addition to his academic credentials, Professor Sarbacker is an active yoga practitioner and teacher, having trained extensively in contemporary yoga and meditation traditions in India and the United States. All right, without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Stuart Sarbacker. All right, I am here today with Stuart Sarbacker. Stuart, welcome to the Yogic Studies podcast. It's really a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks, Seth. It's great to be here. Yeah. Um, We've known each other for some time now, sort of on the the conference and workshop circuit. Uh, But you're somebody who I've really looked up to, honestly, for a while. I've really respected your work as somebody who's been very influential in the field of yoga studies, and I think even helping to define the the way in which we study yoga professionally. Uh, I know you, you've been involved in the AAR and its yoga theory and practice group from in, from the early days, and you've had a number of really important publications uh, from your dissertation work and first book on samadhi, 
And then just some really awesome articles and chapters that you've done on things like the role of herbs and uh, aushadi in, in Patanjali yoga, uh, things like uh, the visual iconography of Patanjali as a serpent and a naga. Uh, and now just recently or, or forthcoming this, this really exciting uh, book uh, that in some ways kind of encapsulates your whole career in, in some ways, you know, everything you've done and your work on yoga to date. So for so many reasons, uh, thanks for being here. And I'm, I'm really excited to, to talk to you today. Yeah, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here, Seth. I appreciate your kind words. And, and I have to say, you know, I've really um, come to admire your work greatly and really the way that your work represents a whole new generation of scholarship that in some ways is significantly more sophisticated than I think much of the work, you know, that I've done with uh, the, the yoga in theory and practice group and the AAR, um, you know, your work represents in some respects what we were hoping the yoga in theory and practice unit would help cultivate. Mm. So, um, so it's great to be here. That's really cool to hear. Um... I, I appreciate those kind words as well. Um, congrats uh, on on finishing this book. Uh, this was an incredibly ambitious book project, uh, and I have to say, you you really pulled it together and have, have done just a wonderful job with this book. It's called "Tracing the Path of Yoga: The History and Philosophy of Indian Mind Body Discipline." So I want to hear a little bit about how this book project came together, but maybe we can start by way of you telling us a little bit about your background and story and how you came to yoga studies, to academia, uh, and also, you know, just your, your own relationship with yoga and this topic. Well, thanks, Seth. I'm trying to think, do you want the long version or the short version here? <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe uh, somewhere in between, maybe, maybe a, an abridged version yeah, sure. that'll allow us to kind of make our way in, in, into the book. That sounds great. Yeah, I'm sure similarly for your experience as an academic and a, and a yoga teacher, there, you could tell a very long narrative, I'm sure, of the many adventures along the way. But let me just start by saying, now, part of my interest in yoga came out of being a philosophy undergraduate student and struggling particularly in the Western kind of philosophical uh, milieu to think about the ways in which um, the re or, or to think about the relationship between ethics um, and really how we live our lives in the real world and what I perceived as sort of the gap between the reals and the ideals of uh, Western philosophy and was introduced to some of the philosophy of yoga and some Buddhist philosophy at a certain point. And it really struck me that not only was there a sort of framework for understanding, you know, one's place within the world and in some respects, what the best way to live within that worldview was, but there are also techniques for really transforming oneself to really bring those, you know, one's goals into alignment with one's experience. And that was interesting to me philosophically, but also personally as a, you know, a person who had really struggled to, you know, be who I wanted to be um, in the world, despite having all of the knowledge and understanding that I had. So that was sort of one piece of the puzzle. Another was a, a sort of deep and abiding interest in worldviews, in different cultures, in narrative and things like that, that really sort of came together for me in terms of shifting from really studying primarily Western philosophy to studying Indian philosophy and more broadly um, Indian religion as well. And so as I shifted from philosophy to doing graduate studies um, in religious studies, in part because that's the context in which I could do the work on Indian philosophy, as well as more comparative philosophy and comparative religion, um, I encountered um, 
Mircea Eliade's Yoga Immortality and Freedom. Mm -hmm. And that book really profoundly changed my life, my sort of scholarly trajectory. Um, it not only brought light to my academic work, but brought light to my budding interests in the practice of yoga, both in terms of modern postural yoga traditions as well as meditation. And that to some extent launched me on the trajectory that's led me to where I am now. Um, mm -hmm. the, and really coming to a broader framework of knowledge about yoga that Eliade presented, which now is in some respects archaic. Um, and, you know, I mean, it was written during the 1950s, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. I mean, that was a really formative element. Mm -hmm. And my work after that sort of built upon really looking more deeply into that larger sort of scope um, and larger question of what yoga is all about. Yeah, I think one of the things that's always struck me is really apparent in your work is I, I can see as you're telling the story, your training in philosophy and ethics and even things like phenomenology, how those kind of informed your your approach to to yoga studies and Eliade's work as well. I do. I kind of see your work in some ways as like continuing where he left off in some ways, and maybe even revising some of the things based on new, new, new scholarship. Um, tell tell us a little bit about. I think w one of the things you've done uh, that's based on your earlier book Samadhi, but I see it as a framing device for this book as well. Are these categories the numinous and the cessative or cessative? I'm not sure how you like to pronounce that one. Um, mm -hmm. But these two different orientations or dimensions to yoga traditions um, and maybe how that kind of builds on Eliade's earlier work. Yeah, thanks. And and you're absolutely right. I mean, part of my enthusiasm for tracing the path of yoga as a project was really looking at the scope of what was out there in terms of a broader, but nonetheless theoretically informed presentations of yoga. And if you look at yoga immortality and freedom, not only are there certain archaic theoretical elements that have been, you know, to some extent abandoned by most scholars of religion, but it, the, the story that Eliade tells really ends at the dawn of the modern era. And so it's as if modern yoga either doesn't exist or can be explained purely in terms of its pre-modern counterparts. Mm. And, um, and I kind of strike a more of a middle ground where, you know, I really argue that there are continuities, but yet the modern era is really a distinct era for the theory and practice of yoga. And, but at the same time, um, I really wanted it to be accessible to a larger audience. So a lot of the apparatus, academic apparatus is actually in the notes mm -hmm. um, so that it provides more of a coherent narrative. In some respects, it's perhaps more like some of Georg Fierstein's work, which really tries to appeal to not only an academic, but a larger audience, while at the same time, I think being a little bit more academically informed and historically grounded than, say, Feuerstein's work. Yeah, but I think you I think you find a nice balance, uh, actually, which is something I'm trying to strike as well, between taking seriously the, the philosophical ideas and inquiries and contributions um, yoga philosophy, let's say, and, and yoga history and the social and cultural dynamics. I, in the beginning, you, you, you kind of identify, you're trying to find that middle ground. And I think you, you're, you're quite successful in doing that. Well, I, I appreciate that a lot. And I should say, you know, a couple of other works that were, you know, have been very formative for me that, you know, in some respects helped me find that kind of place. You know, one was Jeffrey Samuel's book, Mm -hmm. on, on yoga, um, the origins of yoga and Tantra, which really is more about the kind of the social history around yoga and Tantra traditions than it is about the methodologies themselves. Right. That work had a huge influence on me and really 
I draw on him on a number of occasions in, in this new book to really help, you know, give the reader a kind of locus for understanding historically, and, but also politically and economically, where these practices sort of fit into Indian society. Um, but to come back around to your question about the numinous and cessative, mm-hmm. I've also been very influenced by David White's work, you know, mm-hmm. and I think David White was really, to some extent, at the tip of the spear in terms of questioning narratives in which yoga was framed purely in terms of ideas like liberation or moksha um, and liberating insight and these sorts of things and really throwing the the sort of the balance back over towards the pursuit of cities of various powers of vibhutis um, right. as this is the the sinister yogi thesis exactly, right? exactly and though you know maybe i take a little bit more of a moderate position relative to him he nonetheless was instrumental in terms of helping me develop my thinking about the dynamic tension that you see within these traditions between yoga as a means to obtain these extraordinary powers versus yoga as a means to obtain a kind of freedom or liberation from often from embodied existence itself or or at least perfection within the context of embodiment mm. so so that's really what i you know, was focusing on in that first book, um, Samadhi, the Numinous Insensative in Indo-Tibetan Yoga. Um, But it was a very sort of technical argument that really looked principally at the relationship between Patanjali Yoga and Buddhist meditation systems, and then kind of going out a bit from that in terms of looking at the way that dynamic operated. In this new book, I've been able to really expand the scope Um, and really apply that to a much wider range of data, while at the same time, like you're saying, trying to not only talk about that inherent tension between the goal of power versus liberation, but also how those goals are being sought within a context in which there are political, economic sort of considerations at stake, ideological issues, um, but also very importantly, you know, tensions, you know, on the level of class, on the level of gender, and other sorts of uh, elements. So I don't necessarily go in profoundly deeply to all those subjects as much as just sort of opening the door to talking about how not only is there an insight to this, but there's also a reflection outward into how yoga fits into societies and communities. Mm. So just to tie this all together, so what then is the numinous versus the uh, cessative dimension or orientation to yoga. Yeah, so the numinous, which you know is derived from the Latin numen, which means spirit, is the it's really the notion that through disciplining one's mind and body, and this might be through either tapas or a more sort of systematic discipline like yoga, one becomes more like a spirit. In other words, one accumulates the sorts of powers and capacities that are typically attributed to beings on higher cosmological levels. You know, so this might be the divine sight, being able to see near and far, or divine hearing to hear distant things. It might be the ability to read others' minds or fly through the air. Mm. All those sorts of things we would attribute to divine beings, beings that are effectively on the higher cosmological scale. The counterpart to that is the cessative dimension, which is really that idea of, I'm not trying to climb the cosmological ladder, I'm trying to get out of it entirely, or I'm trying to free myself from bondage to it in some shape or form. So one is really... Uh, a mastery of embodied worldly existence. And the other one is really a mastery of the ability to detach oneself, to achieve liberation from bondage to, you know, the, you know whether it's conceived of in terms of birth and rebirth in, in larger cosmological terms of the death of the physical body and rebirth into a new existence, or simply the bondage we experience to things that we're attached to in this life, the way we experience, um, you know, uh, whether it's attachment or addiction or aversion to 
our everyday experience. So mm. whether it's conceived of in those, you know, more mundane terms or more, you know, profound trans mundane terms, cessation is about getting freedom. Mm. And in a work like, just to take an example, if we use Patanjali's Yoga Sutra uh, as, as a model here, Typically, we, we kind of hear it de described as like a life-denying or a sensitive uh, tradition, right? Chitta vritti nirodaha yoga, this trying to still or tame or even, you know, dissolve, destroy uh, all of the turnings of mind. And sometimes it's extended, you know, to this notion of wanting to stop prakriti and materiality altogether in order to isolate or detach one's purusha or, or inner self. Do you do you view the Yoga Sutra, just to take this as an example, we could think of others, do you see it as either one or the other, uh, as, as it, in terms of its main kind of soteriological, you know, its, its, its theory of liberation, do you see it as one or the other, pointing a yogi toward this numinous dimension or uh, sensitive dimension, or do you see it more as as both, that there's kind of both and going on, that there's these different goals and things happening in a text like this? Yeah, well, I would say, first of all, that to the extent to which the goal is Chitta Vritti Niroda, and, you know, and then the sister following verses, Dadaswa Rupe Avastanam, to dwell in the seer, um, that really suggests a kind of cessative goal mm -hmm. that in, in the sense of if what if through yoga, one achieves this sort of cessation of mental fluctuations and the experience of what it is to be the seer and not the seen. In other words, um, to be looking as the consciousness and not identifying with either the mind or the body, that's a very kind of cessative orientation. However, the numinous element of yoga is very profoundly represented within the, the Yoga Sutra itself. Um, and there are a number of different examples. So one, one I like to point out is if you look at among the niyamas, the practice of svadhyaya versus ishvara pranidhana, mm -hmm. in other words, um, you know, literally self-recitation, svadhyaya, and Ishvara Pranidhana, dedication to the Lord Ishvara of yoga. One is described as yielding Ishta Devata Samprayoga, sort of union with one's chosen deity. In other mm -hmm. words, if you recite you know, a text or a mantra, you more or less have a kind of unity with the divine itself. Whereas Ishvara Pranidhana leads to Samadhi Siddhi, sort of perfection of samadhi and presumably they're referring there to the samadhi which leads to niroda um so one way to look at it there is you know it encompasses both the idea of becoming one with or becoming like a divine being mm -hmm. versus entering into this final state and likewise as you go through vibhudipada the third section of the yoga sutra it's it's a sort of laundry list of all the extraordinary capacities all of these numinous powers mm -hmm. again typically attributed to a deity that one obtains through various through samadhi um, through deep meditative absorption on various objects however as you get towards the end and you start to look you start to look for example you know versus 349 forward, there's a sort of sense in which as a person's mastery reaches its zenith, you know, to the point of what might be akin to omniscience and omnipotence, to really achieve liberation, one has to develop a kind of dispassion for that. Mm -hmm. And then there's a sort of a precipitation then of the, the state of Kaivalya. Now, that being said, there are debates, I think, within the, the yoga literature itself, as well as in contemporary, ac contemporary academic context, about whether Patanjala yoga really rejects the use of powers, whether it's really a sensitive model, mm -hmm. no room. And you find people like Ian Witcher, who 
looks at Kaivalya as, yes, abandoning all of these attachments so that you can free yourself. But once you're freed, then perhaps you are able to exercise those sort of extraordinary capacities in ways that are virtuous. And you find, you know, textual witnesses to this, for example, in the Shiva and Linga Puranas, mm. where it describes Ashtanga yoga culminating in Kaivalya, or alternately a kind of state of Jivan Mukti, where one kind of flies around the world kind of like a superhero. Mm-hmm. Uh, sort of one, I think, perhaps tongue in cheek verse about composing poetry in the Dunda meter, which is apparently the most difficult. <laughs> poetic meter in the, in the Sanskrit. Mm. Um, um, and then ultimately entering into Kaivalya. So it sort of suggests mm-hmm. that one doesn't necessarily need to enter into a kind of final state of release, but instead one can exist in a state of liberation in life. Right. So I think there's room for debate. If you lean towards the sort of Sankhya side of the Sankhya yoga equation, you're probably going to emphasize that kind of radical separation. Whereas I think within yoga literature itself, there's perhaps more willingness to be open to the idea of Jivan Mukti. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Whether or not that idea, that model of a kind of liberated while living is, is original, you know, to Patanjali, if it's there, that, that that can continue to be debated, I think. But absolutely, post-Patanjali in, in Puranic and in, in Tantric and Hatha Yoga literature, uh, as we see throughout your book, uh, there's there's so many examples of that more Jivan Mukta type of samadhi. In fact, it becomes the really the more preferred model of liberation or enlightenment, I, I would argue. And in, in some of the Hatha Yoga texts that I'm working on, like in the Shiva Yoga Pradipika, you know, I sometimes think about your numinous and sensitive model because I think you can actually see both things going on in the same text. You can see sometimes samadhi is described as like this stone-like state where the yogin is as if a log or dead to the world. And then elsewhere in the text, it points to all the cities that are accumulated. And as you said, like this kind of flying yogic siddha who's cultivating poetry and taking on any form according to his or her desire in in the world, right? And that that can be in a single text. Um, So I think there's there's sort of levels of soteriology, we might say, sometimes within a, a single text and system. Uh, yeah. But I, uh, I, I think clarifying those kind of two orientations, I think, is useful. Now, in in this book, uh, Stuart, you cover uh, a lot of ground. I mean, it's really it's it's a comprehensive uh, guidebook, right, to yoga's history and philosophical uh, traditions. So it's kind of going all the way back, you know, defining yoga, the prehistory of yoga. I'll read through some of the chapter titles here to kind of give us some bearing, and then we can kind of dive into some topics further. Uh, you have the Indus civilization and the Vedic tradition, uh, Brahminical asceticism and Shramana traditions. We have the classical Hindu model of yoga, Patanjali yoga and Ashtanga yoga. Chapter five, Hindu epic, Puranic and scholastic representations of yoga. Chapter six is then classical Shramana tradition. So you kind of come back to Buddhism and Jainism as they developed later on. Chapter seven, medieval transformation of yoga, Bhakti, Tantra, and Hatha Yoga. Chapter eight, modern yoga traditions. And then finally, the conclusion, tracing the path of yoga. So you trace a a long winding path of yoga across space and time, uh, many thousands of years here. Um, Let's kind of dive in a little bit towards some of the beginning chapters um, and thinking about, you know, this question of of origins, kind of somewhat heated uh, and and certainly debated uh, uh, in in scholarship question. Um, You know, one thing I wanted to ask you about is, kind of how you see your work and, and, and where you come uh, in this book uh, 
kind of against some of Bronckhorst's work about this notion that yoga is um, something that developed outside of the mainstream Brahminical or Vedic tradition, uh, sometimes called extra-Vedic or non-Vedic. And then by the time of like the Kata Upanishad, we see it kind of circling back in and blending. But I think you push back on that a little bit and, and are looking at a little bit more of some proto Vedic roots and legacy of yoga. So tell us a little bit about where you land uh, on that in this book and, and what we can say really about the origins of yoga. Thanks, Seth. You know, one of the things I wanted to say, if you know, particularly on this issue is just how important Bronckhorst's work has been for my own development um, as a scholar. In fact, you know, the the book Samadhi, the earlier book, you know, in some respects was ha, bears a very deep imprint of Bronckhorst's influence, and in part because I think he's one of the people, as you're you know discussing here, who really has looked at the interface between Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain ascetic and yogic traditions, mm -hmm. and um, and I think his work is extremely important. I would encourage anyone who wants to dig a little bit deeper on these sorts of historical and philosophical issues to look at his work. Um, but I will say this, that I found as I went through this material carefully that I did gravitate away from some of Bronckhorst's positions. And there's ultimately a reason for that. And it goes to this issue of yoga having a kind of tension between numinous and cessative dimensions. Mm. So if one were to look at yoga primarily through the lens of cessative models, models that involve especially ideas of obtaining liberation through various ascetic or yogic techniques from the process of birth and rebirth, um, you, you can look to Bronckhorst for that because mm -hmm. one of the things he has looked deeply at is the relationship between Buddhist materials, Jain materials, and Hindu Upanishadic representations of asceticism in yoga. And I think he wants to argue that philosophically, there's a profound influence from Buddhism and Jainism upon the Vedic tradition. And I think over time, he developed even more of this into his um, larger framework of looking at ancient Indian civilization in terms of a, Ma a civilization based in Magadha versus a more Brahminical culture in other parts of India. Right. So he would argue that the, like the, the entire model of samsara, of cyclic existence, of these endless rebirths, and the idea that we're kind of bound to it through karmic activity and we're suffering therefore and that the whole idea of moksha or release from it that that's more of this buddhist or jain or, or shramana uh model is that right that's right and i personally think he makes a very compelling argument about that um however i think it's it falls within that sphere of the challenge of dating different textual strata too <laughs> which I have increasingly over the course of my career felt um, more and more inclined to take with a grain of salt whatever era we're talking about. Because I think often when you dig down beneath the surface to what the arguments are for dating texts, you know, they're often very speculative. And I think Bronckhorst has some very strong arguments for his points about the Jain and Buddhist influence on the Upanishads. But nonetheless, you know, we have, I think, based upon textual and material and other evidence, you know, somewhat of a, you know, how should I say, we, we've got a limited data set to really make these assertions. And, you know, and there's some very wide disagreement, for example, um, you know, one of the key texts in which you see a real important kind of framework for yoga practice developed in the Upanishads is in the Shveta Ashvatara Upanishad, mm -hmm. which Olivelle places within the corpus of the early Upanishads. And my understanding is that Sanderson and his students, um, you know, Sanderson formerly of Oxford University, say that's a text that was actually written significantly later. 
and mm-hmm. was sort of represented as a early Upanishad, but is not in fact an early Upanishad. I mean, that's a huge, huge, that makes a huge difference in understanding what the timeline was like for yoga. It does. And and the Kata Upanishad is another example. Some date as pre-Buddha, the historical, you know, Gautama Buddha, and some date as post-Buddha. And that, as a kind of one of the early syntheses and even kind of definitions of yoga, uh, you know, in the kind of samadhi, mind-body discipline sense. Absolutely. Those, the the Kata Upanishad dates really kind of change the narrative too, right? They absolutely do. And, and the Kata is really critical in terms of early definitions of yoga, but also early framings of the birth rebirth process. So I think it, I think there's a strong argument to say as early as the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, you see some of at least the nascent ideas of a kind of framework of birth and rebirth happening. So it does appear, mm-hmm. you know, pretty early in the corpus, you know, for the most part, but really where you start to see yoga being well-defined in places like the Kata, mm-hmm. that, that makes a huge difference in terms of that liberating insight element um, that, that you see paralleled within the, the Shramana traditions. But to get back to the, the point here that I, was, that I sort of started from, the, if we look at yoga through that cessative lens, then we're in this sort of sphere, looking at the relationship between Shramana traditions and um, the, the sort of emergence of Upanishadic thought. But if we include the sort of numinous aspect of yoga, which in some respects also figures in, in important ways, into the cessative aspect of yoga. We look at yoga as a disciplining of the mind and the body that yields sorts of extraordinary states of perception and action, and by extension, power. Mm. We see many models within the Vedic literature itself of that aspect or that element of yoga practice. So if we exclude the numinous, then yeah, maybe we're looking a bit later. But, um, you know, one of my favorite examples is the Rig Vedic Kation hymn, I believe it's 1036, where you see a figure in kind of, uh, you know, orange robes with long hair flying amongst the gods, demonstrating a number of the powers and capacities that you see attributed to later yogic traditions. Um, as well as, you know, the consumption of visha, some sort of poison or agent. And again, if we look at um, yoga through a kind of purist lens as sort of a cessative model, we might sort of poo-poo the idea of yogic or ascetic practitioners taking substances um, to enhance or to um, catalyze certain types of experiences. But what I've really found as I went through this material is that in all of these different eras of yoga, there are references to various agents. Again, whether it be, you know, uh, avisha or aushadi, or, you know, later on the use of cannabis or datura or other substances that are, you know, part of the yogic and ascetic repertoire for inducing these sorts of extraordinary experiences which yield in principle various powers and abilities um the kation is portrayed as flying amongst the gods more or less so that's one of i think the real key points another though is to point to the fact that within the the vedic and brahminical context you had various practices that become a key part of the more systematic repertoire you see in later yogic traditions, you know, whether that be various types of vrata or vows, um, which may include in some case, you know, practices of penance like fasting. Um, You have practices of pranayama develop, you know, breath control, which is such a critical part of the yogic, uh, yogic systems as time goes forward. and, and a whole sort of host of other practices that, again, I refer to as proto-yoga because they're, they're not clearly formulated into a kind of systematic framework at that point in time, but then later they are. And right. 
And that's why I think, you know, the Patanjali system is so important and so influential in part is because it does bring this range of practices. Some may be shamanic in origin, but many of them are Vedic in origin under this umbrella of a kind of systematic yoga discipline. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's more and more we're realizing what an important moment of synthesis Patanjali and his yoga sutras were of bringing these disparate strands together at a really key moment. Um, but then, as as our listeners will know, of course, the Yoga Sutra is then not the end of the story. If, if we're tracing yoga's path, Patanjali makes this really important intervention and synthesizes these different strands, codifies the, a th- both a theory and a practice, right? What would come to be referred to as yoga philosophy and the yoga darshana. But there's so many more texts and traditions outside of Patanjali's orbit and, and after him. One of the things I've appreciated uh, that you've been doing over the last few years and that, that's made its way into this book is yoga in the Puranas. The, you know, this vast narrative literature uh, that's in some ways uh, the, the most formative texts of, of Hinduism. And there's tons of yoga in the Puranas, right? Tell, so tell us a little bit about what's going on with yoga in the Puranas Um how does that how do you see it kind of connecting to this classical model of patanjali uh and what are some of the kind of cool things that you that you've found in the puranas yeah and uh, you know what one of the ways i've come to think about it is part of the puranic literature and again i think the pur- prana literature is you know one of the key sort of formative bodies of work of you know both oral and then ultimately textual work within the hindu tradition like i think if you want to understand hinduism you know the puranas is one of the really important key places to look um with respect to not only yoga but to many things i see it as sort of a, a both a narrative discourse in terms of telling stories and as a kind of didactic instructional literature and that might be you know instruction in in certain philosophical systems but it might be also instruction in the practice of yoga or particular types of rituals etc and really you see yoga playing a really important role in both aspects of that and one of the things i like to you know emphasize is that just as one might look at the way that yoga is seen to help a human cultivate certain powers and capacities that approximate or um, enable a person to enter into a kind of divine-like mode of perception or action. In the pranas, what you see is that the gods themselves are practitioners of yoga or are represented as practitioners or embodiments of yoga. Um, often framed by the concept of yoga bala, that there's a power of yoga or there are powers of yoga that the gods possess. Mm -hmm. And to me, this really represents an important sort of way of thinking about yoga as not only something that makes humans more powerful, but is in fact the source of the power of the gods themselves. And so both Shiva and Vishnu, for example, are referred to as Yogeshvara or Yogeshvara. Um, in the Shiva Purana, Devi, the goddess, is viewed as the patron of, of yoga practitioners and so forth. Mm. But then within the didactic sections, what you find are long descriptions of how yoga is to be put into practice. And I think very importantly, in contrast to the more kind of elite philosophical commentarial traditions, that you see associated with Patanjali Yoga or the Patanjali Yoga Shastra. Mm-hmm. In the Puranas, you see it more integrated into, you know, sort of life on the ground in terms of particular sectarian orientations, you know, questions about what it means, for example, to practice nonviolence or ahimsa as one of the yoga yamas within the context of one's jati or varna or one's mode of renunciation. Um, and then 
very elaborate, in some cases, uh, very deeply philosophically informed discussions that I think complement and shed light on the elite philosophical tradition in num in numerous ways. Yeah, that's that's really important and and interesting. If the Puranas are perhaps reflecting a little bit more of an on the ground uh, uh, yogi practice rather than a yoga philosophy, is David uh -huh. White kind of makes that distinction right between the philosophers, the, the yoga philosophy, and then the yogi practitioners. If maybe the Puranas might be leaning a little bit more towards towards the yogis. Well, and, you know, another, you know, point that I just really want to emphasize that I think gets to, you know, uh, an issue that's been a bit controversial in the contemporary context is that in many of the Puranas, you'll see discussions of Ashtanga yoga, that will appeal to the kind of Samkhya dualistic framework. Mm -hmm. But ultimate, they ultimately, when it's represented as when one comes to know one's inmost self, you know, and, and separates Purusha from Prakriti, from Prakriti um, one also sort of realizes the truth of the Vedanta system. Right. So in other words, there's many of the pranic accounts of yoga have no problem saying that the the purusha the self that one discovers through the yoga system is ultimately this sort of supreme self you also have a kind of bridging to more sort of sectarian representations of what the divine is you know so the shaiva puranas tend to you know use shiva as a as a sort of ideal object to perform deep meditation on and likewise uh, the the vishnu purana and other vaishnava puranas tend to look to Vishnu. So there's an integration of these different philosophical systems with different sectarian orientations, and then often an integration of emerging methodologies that don't appear in, within the classical sort of milieu, you know, such as different forms of posture or pranayama or breath control practice that look more akin to what you see in the medieval era. Mm. Now, it's really to date this, and I'm in many cases presuming that the Puranic texts are reflecting developments in maybe the early medieval era in some cases, but it's it's possible there was a, a back and forth relationship that some of the medieval practices may have been drawing from articulations in the Puranas. Mm. But the, the bottom line for me is there's sometimes an argument made that, you know, the Ashtanga yoga or classical model of yoga sort of isn't appropriate for the modern era. But what I would argue is that if you look at, for example, Iyengar's light on yoga and the way that he frames yoga within this larger eight-limbed framework, he's actually repeating a pattern that you found hmm. well that you find well documented in the pranas. Right. So, that's that's interesting because today it's very easy, especially for the scholar, to kind of pick up a book like <laughs> light on yoga and say, Iyengar doesn't know what he's talking about. He's reading the Yoga Sutra through an Advaita Vedanta lens. That's not what Patanjali is really saying. And yet, as you're, as you're showing, he's certainly not the first to do that. And in fact, there's a really long, you could say, you know, ancient tradition of, of reading Purusha in that kind of Atman Brahman language of Vedanta. Um, and while we, we, we can maybe suggest that we don't necessarily find that same language in Patanjali's own text, nonetheless, there's a very sustained Vedantic engagement of, of that kind of interpretation that goes really far back. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think there's also, you know, among other things, certain sectarian orientations. So, for example, in the Shiva Purana, the idea of Shiva yoga that there's a kind of very specific type of yoga that falls under the kind of Shaiva rubric mm -hmm. that integrates, you know, these other models, but, you know, frames it within this larger Shaiva identity. You know, that kind of integrative and, um, how should I put it, almost syncretic work is, I think, very characteristic of yoga texts, perhaps in general, but the Puranas in particular. And I know you've 
written and um, done quite a bit of work on Shiva yoga type mm -hmm. formulations. Um, and I, I'm just wondering if that resonates with what you've seen. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a it's it's an example of the ways in which uh, yoga, you know, framed broadly as a as a mind body discipline, as a as a system of ideas and practices, right, for for cultivating um, uh, the human being towards some higher ideal, right? That's like in the broadest sense. But the ways in which that's adapted in different religious environments, and I think Shiva yoga is a way in which things like Ashtanga yoga and Hatha yoga and Raja yoga, depending on the period we're talking, uh, the ways in which those are harnessed for a Shaiva and sometimes even a, a, a devotional uh, milieu. And so that one is attaining union, not simply with some formless Nirguna Brahman, but the, the yoga and that kind of ecstasy and that numinous union is 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 actually with 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 a personalized deity or or sense of of the divine like shiva um or or vishnu you know in in, in a vaishnava context but i think we see it really specifically with something that be called becomes called shiva yoga actually question to you i mean as i'm thinking about this i don't think i've ever seen something called Vishnu yoga or Krishna yoga specifically as like a Sanskrit compound. Have, yeah, have you encountered that I, in any of this literature? I have encountered that and I'm trying to think in the, I, I've definitely seen a Vaishnava yoga uh -huh. referred to in, I think one of the sections of the Shiva Purana um, as a sort of term, but I think it, it may point to a specific practice maybe even uh, i want to say utkranti but i'm i, mm. I should, mm. you know add the caveat i'm i i haven't looked at this in, in quite some time so you do see that but but mm -hmm. i think your general point is right i mean i don't remember at least from my examination of the vishnu purana materials if there's ever a kind of vishnu yoga you know label put on it as much as just a sort of evaluation of the eight limbed system. Yeah. And you'll have, you know, you'll have like Ishvara Pranidhana will be more catered towards a Vaishnava uh, inflection of, of God. Um, uh, and and that, there's often meditation on, you know, Padmas or Lotuses that have Vishnu within them or Shiva. In fact, uh, yeah. So I, I think you find many examples where there's actually a kind of visualization of that deity within a lotus, which is, again, akin to what you see in some of the more medieval tantric ideas of the, you know, subtle or yogic body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But my, I, I would agree. I mean, like my basic point really is that yoga throughout history, right, was adapted and adopted by different groups. And sometimes that those religious outlooks are more, or sectarian outlooks are more uh, explicitly like reflected in the text. And I think when you have something like Shiva yoga, it's typically r right at the forefront, right? Like it's not necessarily saying this is for any Hindu, you know, or any, you know, any, um, any b religious outlook, right? Like in, in a later literature, right? Like, in the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra, this notion that yoga is available for anyone, whether you're a Brahmana, whether you're a Buddhist, a Jaina, a Kapalika, a skull bearer, or even a Charvaka atheist, right? In the Shiva Yoga literature, I don't see that same type of kind of radical universalism like that. It's kind of like, I mean, there is some degree of trying to make things palatable for householders and ascetics. Maybe that's something we can talk more about. But it really is aimed at a, at a Shaiva audience. Yeah, which again, you know, is an, a, an issue that's, you know, has been debated with respect to the Yoga Shastra as well. You know, are, do the sutras themselves reflect a kind of sectarian orientation, Shaiva, Vaishnava, or mm. otherwise? And likewise, the, com the commentarial literature is much easier to kind of sort out on that level. But the, you know, the sutra putta, the sort of text of this, the verses of the text itself 
are more challenging, you know, in light of, in line with what I was saying earlier about the relationship between Sudhya and Ishvara Pranidhana, I mean, you might even argue there's sort of proto-smarta elements there that, mm -hmm. you know, there is a sort of sadguna aspect of the divine, there's a nirguna aspect, and, you know, your Ishtadevata you approach through the recitation of mantras and so forth, whereas Ishvara, this nirguna deity effectively is approached through this sort of deep contemplation of the syllable om. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, actually in the Shiva Purana, there's a section in which there's a discussion of, for those who want to enter into a kind of state of liberation, one recites om, um, but the person who wants mastery over the world rec recites om namo shivaya. So in other words, one either recites the mantra of a kind of nirguna deity or the mantra of a sadguna deity, depending on whether a person wants liberation hmm. or cities effectively. That makes sense. I think the the mantric lines are really interesting. Uh, something I've been thinking more about as I'm in this kind of later medieval Hatha yoga literature, a lot of the, the tantric mantra yoga was omitted, right? In a lot of the Sanskrit Hatha yoga literature, there's not a lot of teachings on mantra, and where we do find mantra uh, is is this internalized yogic mantra of the breath, the mm. ajapa mantra, uh -huh. the unpronounced, you know, the the so hum or hum sa on the in breath and out breath, um, which is not then connected to a particular tantric lineage or deity, uh, is kind of available to anyone who's breathing um and so i think but that just kind of builds up on this point that the mantras are can be very powerful and sectarian specific uh mm -hmm. and we really see that in its fullest fruition in, in the tantric traditions sometimes called the mantra marga the, the path of mantras right yeah well i'm really glad that you brought this up because you know that's really an element which if I could go back and rewrite the conclusion, I might emphasize mm -hmm. the importance of mantra as a kind of thread that runs through the history of yoga. I think it's extraordinary, imp extraordinarily important. And like you're saying, even these sort of nada oriented practices, the yogas of inner sound that you see within Hatha yoga traditions, and that nada is sometimes identified as a kind of, you know, Shabda Brahman, the, the sound of the ultimate or you know, uh, akin to Om itself, which would go with this idea that through Om one enters into this sort of primordial state before manifestation as a kind of, again, what I would call a cessative type of practice. But the larger medieval context, like you're saying, you have tantric traditions, which have, in some cases, just extraordinarily sophisticated um, uh, ritual processes that are really driven by the performance of mantra. Mantra is really at the core of those practices, as well as this sort of, you know, fourfold system of, you know, mantra, laya, hatha, mm -hmm. and raja yoga, in which mantra yoga is at least represented in some context as the sort of, you know, the training, you know, the yoga with training wheels, you know, the yoga for, you know, mm -hmm. that really gets you going on the path, you know, which, yeah, you, know, you might say is sort of a put down, but nonetheless, if that's where you start, it's extremely important. And of course, texts, you know, like the Shiva Samhita, you know, emphasize the way that mantra can be, you know, a, a, a means to achieving your sort of worldly goals in this life. Yeah, but in the larger. Oh, go, go ahead. Go, no, you you keep going. Well, I was just going to say on a larger scope. Um, you know, one of the things that I always sort of, I always found curious was how within Hindu yoga traditions, there seemed to be such an emphasis from early on, as far as, you know, the Upanishads and so forth, in the, the importance of mantra. Mm -hmm. And I always sort of thought, you know, in early Buddhism, you know, we might call Nikaya Buddhism, and then the more sort of conservative branch of Theravada Buddhism, like, 
why did the Buddha sort of abandon mantra mm. if it's such a critical part of the yogic perspective? But the reality is that Buddhists did not abandon mantra. Um, they have an extra, extraordinarily, in, in Theravada Buddhism, you have a system called parittas, which are protective chants. Sure. Um, citing texts, in many respects, I see them as very akin to Vedic ritual mantra performance. Um, yeah, I think the question is whether that was something that maybe came a little bit later. Um, I want to, and I want to get to, I'm glad we're kind of moving towards Buddhism because that's where I actually, I want to head. But before we do, you know, as we're talking about mantra and its importance, I'm just thinking of uh, my friend and colleague Finney and Garrity's uh, mm -hmm. really important work on Om and, and mantra and, and yoga. And I think Finn would would argue that this is really one of the key Vedic contributions to Indian religion and mm -hmm. to yoga, and maybe might also push back a little bit at Bronkhorst to say like this is an early proto yoga that we find in in the power of of, of speech and mantra as well mm -hmm. as breath and and these sort of different yuktis and, and rites in the in the Vedic literature, um, but that maybe. Um, and I'm I'm no expert on on the early Buddhist material at all, but maybe maybe there was an early period of not including mantra because that was seen as an explicitly Vedic and Brahminical practice, and so maybe it wasn't until a little bit later uh, that that became more important in the in the Buddhist traditions. Um, certainly, you have this the importance of sound and speech, like the Buddha. Vachana, the words of the Buddha himself are, are, are you know, considered to be the mm -hmm. Dharma and mm -hmm. to have this kind of sacrality and, and efficacious power to, to, to word and sound, right? Um, yeah, but well, let's, 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 shift, let's shift towards Buddhism and Jainism, uh, because one thing, you, another important thing you do in the book is I think you give a good balance of emphasis to not only looking at the Hindu and Brahminical traditions, but to Buddhist and Jain uh, formulations uh, of yoga and, and their important influence as well. I think this is something we've really, we've kind of always known uh, the, that Buddhism had an important role to play in, in yoga and like, you know, influencing the Yoga Sutra. But I think over the last 10 or 15 years, I think we've learned a lot more about how influential in particular, Buddhism has been on on shaping yoga philosophy, and then maybe even later in in Hatha yoga, perhaps even shaping some of the Hatha yoga practice. So some mm -hmm. of the work that's come out from Jim Mallinson and a Hatha yoga project on maybe the Vajrayana um, origins or um, contributions to to Hatha yoga, but it, at several key places, right within the the story of yoga, we see. Buddhism playing this really influential role. Uh, so how did you kind of approach that side of yoga's story uh, in this book? And um, let's kind of lean into the Buddhist and then maybe also the Jain side uh, sure. of yoga's story. Sure. Well, you know, just to sort of go back for a moment to your comments about Finian's work, you know, I was, I, I was looking over your podcast list and I was thinking, I really need to listen to that the the session you did with with Finian Garrity because I think I really think he's his his research is very innovative and novel and very insightful mm. and so um, both for myself and you know for your listeners um, I'm, I want to uh, encourage you know myself and others to uh, yeah please go back it was our first ever episode so ignore my um, incompetency but Finn. Uh, did an amazing job uh, uh, as usual. It's, it's actually it's our it's our most listened to episode. So go back and and, and start at the beginning with Om. Yeah, I, I'll do that. So so along the lines of what you, you were talking about there with respect to Finian's work, you know, I was influenced by Laurie Patton's work, this idea of bringing the gods to mind and how Vedic mantras were a way of to some extent, embodying the powers of the gods themselves as one sort of recites and visualizes, you know, their different attributes. Mm -hmm. And um, and akin to that, and she, she mentions this very specifically, that, you know, there is that 
liturgical power of invoking and visualizing the deities, and to some extent, you know, participating in or approximating their powers, but there's also the mental dexterity involved that, you know, the performance of mantra, especially in a Vedic context, was, was and still is a very intense disciplining of one's speech. And, um, and, and so there's a certain, again, proto-yogic element, I think, there of that kind of discipline involved in the mantras, as well as this sort of the, the, the power of mantra to kind of awaken in oneself certain powers and capacities. And again, I think you see this in the Buddhist literature. And in addition to, say, reciting the word of the Buddha, reciting certain, you know, important suttas like the Metta Sutta as a kind of, you know, uh, liturgical practice, there are, you know, meditative processes. Most of the, or I should say, many of the kind of classical objects of meditation, you know, recollection of the Buddha, has a kind of script that one mentally follows as one visualizes these different deities. And so there's an intimate relationship, I think, between the ability to memorize and recite a text and in some cases to you know, perform the meditation. I th mm -hmm. think you see this in tantric traditions as well, where you have these tantric liturgies, which are really reciting a description of a deity within their mandala or their abode. And so the mantra, plays a critical role in, you know, formulating that um, visionary sort of experience. But on the topic, though, of Buddhism more broadly, you know, again, you know, Bronkhorst's work, the work of Jerry Larson was very influential in my thinking about this sort of interface between uh, Buddhism and yoga. And as, as you're, I think, probably well aware, Seth, you know, if you look through the secondary literature of yoga, you will find people talking about yoga in all sorts of contexts, mm. where if you actually go back and look at the texts themselves, there's no mention of the word yoga or of yogis or yoginis. Um, there's a kind of phenomenon where yoga becomes a sort of catch-all mm -hmm. that is applied to texts where yoga really isn't being discussed, you know, something perhaps like yoga is. And so one of the things I really wanted to do was to kind of separate the wheat from the chaff with respect to whether we can talk about yoga explicitly, um, you know, as a topic within Buddhism and Jainism, as opposed to just sort of applying our ideas of yoga to what Buddhists are doing and sort of labeling it that. And, and really what I found was that there are threads that go back to very early strata of Buddhist literature and Jaina literature um, in which yoga is really explicitly mentioned or yoga practitioners. And particularly within a, you know, one strain of Theravada Buddhism and in perhaps more broadly within Mahayana Buddhism, there are very strong explicit notions of the practice of yoga, especially as being tied up to those people who practice dhyana or meditation. Mm -hmm. So as you have the term, for example, uh, yoga chara bhikshu, which appears in the Buddhist literature that really singles out, or yoga chara bhikshuni, uh, a practitioner of yoga, um, and in particular people within that semantic context you know, who are practicing meditation in particular, which appears to be a counterpart to those who, who were not. In other words, there were, you know, probably sort of scholastic monastic practitioners that didn't really engage in meditation, but then there were some people who were very serious about it. Mm -hmm. And they had a kind of special and to some extent privileged position within Buddhism. Um, I'm trying to think, is it... Uh, Jonathan Silk, I believe, has written a couple of long essays on this topic, which were very eye-opening for me, and I would encourage people who are interested in looking into this more deeply mm. to look into. So you have very explicit understandings, as well as the fact, you know, and you see this, for example, um, 
illustrated in the work of Karen O'Brien Bopp, who I believe, mm-hmm. again, did a podcast session for you. Yeah, yeah, she, she looked, did a course on, on this interface between Patanjali yoga and Buddhist yoga and meditation, but particularly looking at yogacara Buddhism, mm-hmm. as well as Abhidharma. Um, right, right. So there's clearly cl- cross-pollination going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think in general, it's been thought that, you know, Patanjali yoga and some of the Hindu yoga systems are really integrating, sort of synthesizing some of the materials in the other traditions. But I, I'm I'm inclined to believe that there were influences in both directions. I mean, you see this perhaps more clearly in Jainism, where the Ashtanga yoga framework becomes one of the key sort of orthodox ways to talk about yoga. So you see a really explicit embrace of that eight limb system, which is associated more with this sort of Sanskritic Brahm- Brahminical representation of yoga. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but, you know, it's, it's hard to discern those threads. And I think, like I was saying before, you know, tracing these concepts as they move from the sort of textual, one textual witness to another, I think is really tricky given the fact that there are, I think, huge gaps in the record. Mm -hmm. And in some respects, I think those gaps may influence, you know, what directions our scholarship is pulled. So for example, you talked about tantric Buddhism. I think the relationship between Buddhist and Hindu Tantra, from my perspective, is is still relatively obscure. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing, for example, um, I think you were intimating this text, the Amrita City, which seems to be a, a kind of key text and a Buddhist text for the dissemination of uh, ideas and practices that became instrumental in Hatha Yoga. Mm-hmm. But I'm I'm left wondering, you know, is this Amrita City text, which clearly seems to be a Buddhist sort of framing within certain Shaiva language and terminology, sure. really the sure. beginning of the picture, or are there Shaiva texts that were being, you know, drawn on for that that you know are just mm-hmm. gone from the record? Um, so. Yeah. You know, I talked to Jim about this, Jim Allenson, who's written extensively on this. And, you know, his argument is we go with, you know, the best records we can to sort of build the arguments about, you know, the historical development of these traditions. And if new texts appear on the scene, then you revise mm-hmm. that. that mm-hmm. theory. And I think I that's, think, a, that's yeah, reasonable. It's a, it's a fair and important question. Uh, something that Ben Williams and I were just talking about recently, because Ben has been, we just did that panel for the AAR on on chakras and looking at kind of the, the genealogy and the development of different chakra systems in Ben in Shaiva Tantric and me in more of the Hatha Yogic sources. And it's so clear there's still this really important legacy and debt to Shaiva Tantra that, that so many of the Hatha Yoga texts and traditions are drawing on uh, that we can almost uh, forget about how important still Shaiva Tantra is in the development of, of uh, the Nath traditions and then and then what, what shows up in the Hatha Yoga literature. Um, Absolutely. Think, well, and well, on that point, yeah. there's the you know, the pervasive influence in the medieval era of the Shadanga six-limbed yoga system, Mm -hmm. which is developed very extensively, both in primary and secondary commentarial texts in both the Hindu Shaiva traditions, as well as in Buddhist, Tantric, or Vajrayana contexts. And along with, you know, I sort of argue in the book that along with the Ashtanga yoga system, this is one of the primary systemic formulations of yoga that you see in that kind of post-classical era. Mm. It's kind of similar to the the earlier origins question, right? Is this thing called yoga, is it coming more from the Brahminical traditions? Is it, you know, what, what, what are the elements coming from the Shramana traditions? 
we kind of see it this happening again in this Hatha Yoga moment, the turn of the second millennium, 11th, 12th century, perhaps, is when it's showing up in the text. But again, we have these different streams and sources that we see kind of coming into this Hatha Yoga thing. Um, what I will just say really briefly is that uh, it is really compelling that in the Shaiva Tantric literature, uh, we do not find the term Hatha Yoga. Although we can maybe find those some of those elements and you know metaphysics and theory that undergirds Hatha Yoga, especially like just the whole Kundalini Shakti and that really important model, um, the the term Hatha Yoga is not used. And I think we can say on pretty solid ground now that 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 does seem to be from the Buddhist side using that term um, because it's not only the Amrita City but. Uh, Jason Birch's work and then and then continuing, you know, Jim's found, I think, almost two dozen Buddhist texts from around 8th to 11th, 12th century um, that are using the term Hatha Yoga. Um, maybe even some a little bit earlier. I feel like there's an early reference in Yogacara uh, text. Um, so it's interesting. It seems like the, the term of this kind of forceful yoga or the yoga of force uh that seems to have been coined in a vajrayana uh milieu but i agree like the amrita siddhi is a very syncretic text uh there's there's important tantric buddhist deity and and elements that are invoked but there's a lot of shaiva terminology and ideas that are there as well and i think even thinking about it as it has to be buddhist or shaiva in that kind of uh, black and white way is actually a little bit misleading about maybe how some of those Mahasiddha traditions kind of conceived of themselves uh, as transcending those those boundaries a bit more. That, that, that's a great point. And, you know, this conversation too plays, in perhaps, plays into a, perhaps a larger conversation as well about the origins of Tantra itself. And again, that's a sort of hotly debated issue as to whether Tantra is really something adopted first in the Hindu tradition, you know, sort of following the sort of Sanderson argument coming out of a kind of Hindu yogini cult that gets adapted into Buddhism, but at the same time there being, you know, certain textual contexts within Buddhism that seem to push the Buddhist date back uh, considerably. Uh, and and I sort of in the book I go for a kind of multifaceted sort of way of looking at this in terms of, you know, perhaps not being as focused on sort of, you know, who was the first as much as what are the constellation of practices that get kind of integrated under this larger umbrella of tantra, yeah, and and then you know and and then speak to the way they're represented within these sort of parallel traditions. Mm. So, you know, again, there's so much material here. This is it's very well researched. Um, it, it really takes into account all of the, the, you know, the, the new research that has come out, your, you know, your own included. What were some of the, the biggest challenges for you in, in writing a book like this? And then second, were there any surprises for you in writing this book? Things that you thought maybe you had like a good handle on or just new things that you learned from, from this research and, and writing process? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the, you know, it's, it's, as you mentioned at the beginning, this is a very ambitious project. And, you know, and I realized that there are limitations to doing a work that really covers the scope of material that I'm working on. And, and, you know, since finishing the book, I, you know, I routinely have the thought like, Oh, I wish I had included this or talked more about that. Right. Et cetera. So, you know, one of the biggest challenges was really saying, you know, what am I going to sh shine my light on here? You know, and how do I balance, you know, a focus on say the social, political, economic dimension, which really talking about the kind of nuts and bolts practice of yoga. And I kind of settled on trying to really build a kind of framework. So the reader sees the kind of social, political, economic, et cetera, context that the practice is developed within, but then really try to, you know, bring clarity to the components 
And, and that meant, among other things, you know, really focusing on terminology and to the degree possible going to the text themselves and just sort of validating that the terminology that I'm using to frame these different practices is at parity with what's in the actual record. You know, the goal being that, you know, a reader can go through this and really learn the language of the practice itself and come out with a, a, a much closer relationship with the, you know, semantic context in which these were developed. But, you know, that that was a, a challenge because, you know, I don't want to overwhelm the reader. At mm -hmm. the same time, I want as much transparency as possible. The other thing was, as I wrote the book, not only what was I doing research that was changing my perspective on, you know, the elements of yoga that I'm most interested in, you know, there's been all of these other projects going on, like the Hatha Yoga Project, which have been churning out, you know, these sort of groundbreaking works year after year that have really, I think, profoundly transformed our understanding of the, the history of yoga traditions. Mm -hmm. And so, finding a way to speak to the emerging, these emerging understandings, you know, was in tension with trying to write something that was relatively comprehensive and definitive. And, you know, one of the ways I resolved that is, you know, there are certain questions I just, you know, more or less say, I'm not going to try to answer here because either there's so much debate on it or we just don't really have the evidence we need to make certain assertions. And so I guess in the end, I thought about it somewhat pragmatically, like let's say um, that the book is used by Jim Mallinson's students at SOAS, hopefully it will provide opportunities for them to engage in these debates. For example, like, you know, where does Hatha Yoga come from? Or where does Tantra come from? Even if it doesn't necessarily provide a solid answer for that, it's at least bringing up the conversation. Mm. Yeah. And then were there things that surprised you uh, along the way? Um, maybe, maybe something, something mm -hmm. that you just, that, that just kind of was new, new for you uh, that, yeah. that came through in the research. Obviously you, you, you've been, you've been kind of in this world and reading all of this literature for, for so long now, I think we can kind of, um, we, we see the forest and not the trees or vice versa. Yeah. Were there any new trees that maybe popped up for you in, in your forest of yoga? There were definitely, there were definitely moments where I felt like I sort of broke through to a new level in terms of my understanding of the, the historical development of yoga, as well as I think moments where my understanding of different yoga philosophies, you know, either were clarified or transformed. Um, you know, in terms of the big picture, I mean, the importance of mantra, which we talked about, really came through to me in a way that I think hadn't before as one of the important threads of yogic practice. Mm. Um, the importance of oshadi and other sorts of, you know, catalytic psychoactive agents, you know, was another sort of critical important issue um, as we talked about, I think the the importance of the the use of the language of yoga or yoga practitioners among Buddhists mm -hmm. and the sort of affinity for certain Buddhist models with you know Hindu models of yoga really sort of came through to me as well as I developed the project. I think too, you know, on the on the social level, I felt like you know I, there was more of a sense as I developed the book of the ways in which these different sort of textual historical traditions and their practices parallel or interface with the larger kind of changing social world. Um, you know, I also had some sort of deeper reflections on, you know, some of this issues of gender and sexuality mm -hmm. within the concept of yogic practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, you know, live in an era where I think I would hope, you know, like the chapter on modern yoga in the text, if not the book as a whole, would orient people to the fact that you know, gurus are very powerful people. And as much as, 
um, you know, how should I put it, that as much as it may serve the purposes of transmitting yoga to sort of open oneself up to the authority of, you know, a teacher or a guru figure, that there's a lot of power invested in, in the guru. And that power historically has not always been used in a compassionate or kind way. And that, you know, I think I'm less naive about the role of power and authority within yoga. And hopefully the reader will come away from the text more deeply informed and perhaps with a little bit more of a critical eye mm-hmm. to some of the issues as well. Yeah, it's actually, I mean, it's it's really hard to write the chapter on the history of modern yoga and all the modern yoga schools and lineages that are divorced from the politics and culture of abuse and power dynamics that have come to light in recent years. If one chooses to ignore that, they're also ignoring an important part of even you know these institutional histories, but also the very um, personal histories of people's lives involved uh, with these traditions. And I think that's becoming harder and harder uh, to really um, write about in, in, a, in a sensitive way that's kind of taking everything into account. Um, but I, we haven't talked as much about the modern yoga. One thing I did want to just ask you, I think, you know, I think one will come away from your book with a sense of more continuity than anything. I think there's some that might suggest that there's, you know, these you know, big ruptures between what we might call pre-modern and modern yoga uh, and notions that so much of what people are doing today under the rubric of yoga uh, is, is, is really new and novel in the last 100 or 150 years. Um, but again, I, I think, uh, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think mm-hmm. you, you, you found more continuity than, than not. Um, so how do you um, kind of approach thinking about the pre-modern versus the modern um, and kind of connecting what we've been talking about in this conversation just up to, you know, yoga today? Yeah, th- thanks, Seth. And, and this is, a, I think, a really important and intriguing question, and I and I don't necessarily feel like I have, a, you know, all the answers on this, despite having covered so much ground. You know, I do think you know each era of yoga is unique in certain ways, and um, you know, co- coherent to the sort of historical context in which it appears. But yeah, I I think I am arguing that there are threads of continuity that extend, you know, through these different eras, you know, one of them being, you know, just simply the idea that when you discipline your mind and body, it becomes very powerful and that power is kind of ambiguous or, you know, has some sort of ambivalence in terms of how it's applied. Um, I think that principle is one that really ties together the way that yoga is utilized and adapted in these different eras. And it, you know, one of the things I've sort of argued is that you know, if we look at this numinous cessative tension, the sort of perfection versus liberation dynamic, um, you find that you know exemplified within the modern context as much as you do in other eras, where you know whether whether it is you know pursuing yoga for sort of beautification or for a competitive edge or for you know some degree of bodily mastery, you know, there's still a very important element within modern yoga that really revolves around trying to become a more perfect embodied being. Mm. Likewise, there's an element of trying to free oneself from, you know, ill health or stress or other types of things. And these may be perhaps more mundane, you know, goals, but Mm. nonetheless, they reflect that continuing tension between yoga as a means to sort of enhance oneself versus yoga as a kind of therapeutic means. That being said, you know, hopefully, you know, a reader who reads that chapter in Modern Yoga will see that there are disruptions, that yoga is integrated into a kind of more 
modern uh, physical culture framework, both in terms of the way it's thought about as, as well as the way it's practiced. There are threads of occult and theosophic and other types of um, ideological and metaphysical thinking that sort of enter into the picture. So it is thoroughly transformed, you know, as documented in work such as, you know, Mark Singleton's well-known book, Yoga Body. Mm -hmm. But my point is that despite these transformations, many of the same operating principles are involved um, in, the, in the way that yoga is practiced and its effects. Mm -hmm. And one interesting note is that one of the things I've really loved about Jason Birch's work is I think Jason Birch has really helped show that the transition from say the medieval era of yoga to the modern era of yoga was not a sort of you know abrupt kind of abyss mm -hmm. but instead you really see gradations of transformation a sort of proliferation of asanas in late medieval yoga which he's written about mm -hmm. which to some extent set the stage for modern traditions um, and so so you know I've tried in part riffing on Jason's work to also point that, yes, there are disruptions. At the same time, we do see some of the precursors of these modern postural traditions in these late medieval contexts. Yeah, I think, I think that's important. And yet the rate at which yoga and its hybrid forms is accelerating today with goat yoga and beer yoga and <laughs> virtual reality goggle yoga and you know you name it always begs the question then of 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 what is yoga and where do the kind of boundaries around this thing that we're calling yoga kind of begin and end so as we kind of wrap up here at Stuart and as we've traced the path of yoga in your book where did you kind of settle on this question of what is yoga and kind of defining yoga, having kind of saturated yourself through this entire history and all of this philosophical materials? Um, how, how do you define or delimit uh, yoga uh, in this book and, and maybe, you know, for, for our listeners? Well, you know, I, I provide a somewhat academic argument early on in the book that yoga is first and foremost a type of mind-body discipline that's developed in the Indic context. Mm -hmm. Really, that gets at two things. One is its Indic origins, and two, the idea that it's really about practice. It's about developing a kind of discipline of mind and body. And then secondarily, it can refer to the goal of that practice. So um, and in fact, many academics in the contemporary context will say that yoga is first and foremost a goal. But mm -hmm. sure, I'm saying that it can refer to that goal, but it's always within the context of that discipline. And then right. by extension, yoga becomes a term that can then be uh, placed next to or appended to other types, to, to particular types of practice, you know, whether that be hatha yoga, raja yoga, bhakti yoga, and so forth. In other words, a discipline that's centered on a particular mode of practice, or it can be associated with particular teacher's names, Shivananda yoga, or Iyengar yoga, etc. cetera. Um, actually, Patrick McCartney, who's a, an anthropologist who works quite a bit on modern yoga, likes to talk about yoga as a sort of floating signifier. Mm -hmm. So um, as you sort of as yoga gets further out there, you know, you can, you know, associate with just about anything, goat yoga, etc. Mm -hmm. And it takes on a kind of sort of exotic charm, you know, again, maybe perhaps in its connection to this, you know, ancient Indic context. So that's kind of the groundwork for the way that I think about yoga in terms of this, the sort of bigger picture. But I think there are some really challenging questions about the commodification of yoga and the appropriation of yoga you see in contemporary contexts. And, you know, I think both yoga scholars and practitioners come down in very different ways as to where do you draw the line and say something isn't yoga or where do you draw the line and say something isn't respectful? Um, a couple of years ago, I was at the Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandiram in Chennai, mm -hmm. 
Mm. And I asked one of their faculty members, you know, what do you think about the way in which yoga in some cases has been appropriated in perhaps questionable ways? Mm-hmm. And she said, you know, I don't mind, for example, you know, European and American yoga practitioners wearing saris or sort of donning some of the kind of elements of Indian or Hindu culture as part of their yoga practice, because, you know, she said, I think this is sort of a way of showing respect for the cultural context of yoga. But when they start wearing bikinis with Vishnu on them or, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, moving beyond what they would pers- what she would perceive as kind of good taste, then things start to get more problematic. And I think that's a very moderate sort of position. I think there are others who think that if you don't give, you know, reference or deference to the Indian tradition, that there's something very problematic happening, mm-hmm. um, some sort of cultural appropriation. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a big topic, um, but I think what um, what the woman said in Chennai is is important because there's um, intentionality matters, respect matters in all of this as a scholar, as a practitioner, as a human being living in the world today, and how we're interacting with each other and uh, different cultures and ideas, um, and I think you know, just being kind of transparent about what we know and what we don't know. And uh, just to bring it back to the book here as we wrap up, I think you've done a a really incredible job of kind of um, highlighting and putting together in 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 a readable and coherent way what we do and what we don't know about yoga uh, today, uh, at the end of 2020. And uh yeah, really, Stuart, I commend you on this book. I think it fills a really important uh, niche or need in terms of having a single book that really kind of takes seriously both yoga's history and philosophy and is comprehensive and kind of stands up. You know, even if you come down in different places here and there with with certain scholars, that's that's good, right? Because then that brings up moments of question and debate, as you were saying. But to have kind of the whole story and all the the material that we have kind of in one cohesive book, well, well done. I think uh, listeners should should definitely read this book if you're into this stuff. If you've made it this far in the conversation, <laughs> you're gonna really <laughs> dig this book. Uh, where where and when can uh, can people find uh, this book? So it will be published on January first, and that's through. SUNY, the State University of New York Press. And then, of course, it'll be available through various outlets. I'm sure it'll appear on Amazon and at your local bookstore. I would hope if you, probably if you request it, if they don't order it themselves. Great. Okay. Well, we'll we'll, we'll provide some links in the show notes uh, for people. And um, I don't know, is there is there anything else? We've covered a lot of ground, but any, any final thoughts or, or, or anything today, Stuart? Um, the only thing I would say is, first of all, thank you for having me. It's been a really enjoyable and edifying conversation. And that, you know, I, I want to say in all humility that, you know, it was a it was a big project and inevitably certain things don't get covered. But I really hope that people who do read it, you know, will find some resources for really looking more deeply at what yoga is, both in its historical context. Um, whether it be in terms of a person's own personal practice or for chasing down particular academic ideas that they want to pursue further. So um, I offer it out to you in hopes that um, you will all get something good out of it. Great. Well, thank you for for your offering, Stuart, uh, for your time today and uh, for your important scholarship uh, and and teaching. Uh, I look forward to being in touch Wishing you and your family happy holidays and stay safe out there. And uh, to all of our listeners, same to you as well. Thank you, everyone. And please uh, take care. All right. Bye, Stuart. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Yogic Studies podcast. 
you've enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes or sharing this episode with someone else. Thanks so much, everyone. Until next time, please take care.